Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 179 with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling, motherfuckers? Hope you guys are well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated, um, well, all the other words that requires well. I forgot my run on that I usually do in the beginning of the intro, but I hope you're well. Happy fucking Friday to everyone out there and happy end of the week. And um, for those of you that are freelancers, I think it's just happy any other day. For those of you that live in a four-hour work week, happy I'm um, happy that you're hearing me and you're still alive. For those of you that are just loitering around, um, scrooging, I mean, uh, sponging off your parents, congratulations. You are one of the lucky ones. Don't waste your opportunity. Now, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great. Um, I'm a little bit upset with myself, but a little bit, um, I'm a little bit upset with myself, but I'm also happy I'm upset. Right, this would you know those weird sort of like you know when you can hold you can hold two ideas in your head at the same time or two emotions um inside your body at the same time and that's how I feel at the moment. So I'm a bit upset because I'm quite happy that it's Friday, right? And I know for those of you listening to the show for a while, or for those of you that have heard me in the recent weeks, or for those of you that see me in person, or for those of you that have heard me speak in person, for those of you that might be my friends, you'll know that I'm not someone that um, ascribes to the idea of like looking forward to days, right? If anything, my favorite day of the week is a Monday, right? I love a Monday because it's a chance for me to reset and to start um, and start again and anything I wanted to do previously because, you know, by and large, I'm always doing some sort of scheme, some sort of plan, some sort of workout regimen, some sort of diet, some sort of content plan, some sort of practice i want to do whatever it may be called some sort of skill i want to learn i'm always doing something every week right so mondays for me are an opportunity for me to correct the wrongs that i've um i've done last week or to build on the rights that i've done the previous week so for me it's a good time to kind of you know press start uh press reset or turn on a new leaf but i know for most people that subscribe to the whole like work days um work days have a big influence on how i feel sort of um idea mondays probably represent um, the worst time of the week or or maybe even a Sunday evening right when it's fast approaching 8 p.m and you're just lying in bed watching some benign thing on Netflix or scrolling through your social media feed it's like oh fuck man I have to go back to this bullshit again on Monday I get it I understand and I feel your pain but I think um, primarily in my um, experience or for me personally I kind of I don't ascribe to that sort of feeling because in my head or my dreams or the things that I want to do, they are far and above anything that's happening in the present, right? So I have very lofty ambitions for what I want to do in my life. So I think all this stuff I'm doing now is just temporary. And it's sort of like, um, it's the path I have to go down in order to get to what I want to get to at the end of the road, right? And there is no, there is no end of the road really, but I'm just talking about figuratively, right? It's where I want to get to in terms of my overall dreams. So when it comes to working week to week, I just take it for what it is. You know, it, it kind of allows me to um, st- speak to you guys, allows me to pay my hosting fees, allows me to pay my rent, uh, buy food, whatever it may be. You know, it, it, it has its benefits, but I don't see it, I don't see anything past that. Right. Because I have other dreams, I have other aspirations. So I kind of get a bit tempered down. But I think in the last few weeks or in the last few months, I've kind of reached a bit of a stumbling block. I've kind of reached a bit of a low point where I'm starting to think, fuck, man, how long is it going to take for me to finally get to where I want to get to, right? Because I'm starting to do the things that I said I was going to do. I'm DJing regularly. I'm recording a podcast regularly. I'm reading a lot. Um, I might, I'm might. i not blogging as much as I should be blogging. I'm still going to do in terms of writing because I want to write a lot because I'm not doing that at the moment. Um, what else I'm not doing at the moment? I'm probably not vlogging as much as I said I would vlog either. I haven't done that. I'm not making as many videos, maybe, that aren't podcast. So there's things that I'm not doing, but for the most part, the things that I really want to do in terms of podcasts and DJing, I'm doing them, right? So I'm, I'm at that level where I'm able to play out most weekends. Um, I'm able to record a podcast every other day, and I'm able to get, you know, a decent amount of downloads, a decent amount of views on YouTube. So I'm kind of like, fuck, man, like, how long is it going to take me to finally get to where I want to get to, innit? So it kind of gets you a bit down. And when that gets me a bit down, I start to then get a bit annoyed with my work right because usually i don't get annoyed with the, my nine to five my nine to five is usually the thing that i think is my um uh, it's sort of like the scaffolding around my building essentially right it, it kind of it's my support system in a kind of way right but if you take it off it's not gonna you know the building ain't gonna collapse but it kind of helps me to do things you know to you know, to make sure I, I can do some repairs and some maintenance around the building so that's how i kind of see my workplace but now, um, because I'm feeling down with the stuff I'm doing outside of it, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm attaching 
I want to say ego, but I'm attaching expectation to what I'm doing, right? Which I wasn't doing before. I was a bit expectationless. I kind of just did stuff and threw it into the internet. The same way how I use social media. When I post on Instagram, I sort of post and dump. I don't really interact or go on it or browse, look at people's stories. For the most part, I'm kind of just like now and off of it. Maybe apart from the weekend, if I'm high or something, I might kind of browse through people's stories and shit. But for the most part, I kind of tend to like keep a bit of distance from it. So I've kind of seen myself get a bit down and a little bit, you know, a bit annoyed with work. And that obviously leads to me now, this today, kind of like waking up before I went to the gym, like thinking to myself, oh, thank God it's Friday. And I had to catch myself when I said that. I was like, nah, no, 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 no. That's not me. I can't be saying those kind of words. Those words can't be even uttered in my mouth, let alone um, said in my head. Um, but I've kind of, un I've recognized the, I've recognized the emotion. I sat with it and I was just like, you know what? Cool. What this basically means is that I'm attached to expectation to what I'm doing, right? And I need to not do that. I need to kind of pull myself back and kind of observe what I'm doing and just be thankful of just how much I've done so far and just see so much room, how much room there is for growth and where else I can go in what direction, what else I could do. And hopefully by committing myself to getting better at certain things or by committing myself to doubling down on reading a lot because imagine I read an hour or two hours a day but I could be doing more I could be doing an hour interrupted I could be doing two hours uninterrupted I could be taking time out on my weekends to read because I usually only read Monday to Fridays when I'm at work um from during my lunch break or on my way to work and on my way back from work you know I mean that kind of commute thing I could be doing those things I'm not doing them as much as I could be I could be recording pod I could be recording even more podcasts I could be recording more videos and cutting them up and making them more YouTube friendly. I could be, um, what else? I could be maybe talking about more interesting things, maybe stuff that's going to, I don't know, increase my vir virality, virality, right? Um, I could be recording more DJ mixes and getting them out there and kind of tagging people and whatever it may be. I could be doing a lot more things that could be getting me close to where I want to get to. So I can't be that annoyed that I'm feeling the way I'm feeling because that means essentially there's some gaps missing, some things I'm not doing. By and large, I'm doing what I want. I'm doing what I think is bright and I'm kind of slowly but surely getting to where I think I should be going to. I'm in a kind of the right direction, but I need really to steer myself on the correct course and get myself where I need to get to. So that's kind of where I've been mindset wise. And because of that, I think it's no coincidence that once I kind of was thinking that way, the podcast I'm listening to at the moment is an episode of Ari Shafir Skeptic Tank. Um, you can check it out on iTunes and whatever you listen to podcasts. It's called Ari Shafir Skeptic Tank. And it's episode number 353 with none other than Tim Ferriss. All right, and I got it there on the camera if you guys are watching. If not, then you can um, view it another time. But Tim Ferriss is basically the guy that started all this for me, right? He's the one that started this whole entire journey of um, realizing that maybe exchanging my time for money in terms of in a working in kind of you know in the workspace wasn't the most effective effective use of my time and having this idea of a deferred life plan the idea is that you know i will do x y and z when i'm this age right when i finally retire then i'll finally go and ride my motorcycle across china that's the example they use in the book or that's when i'll finally go and decide to move to berlin or that's why i finally go and move to nicaragua no you can do it right now so that's what i'm kind of focusing on doing um making sure i do that and part of the journey that i'm going to do now is i'm going to i'm actually going to paris um in a couple of months so to go visit um girlfriend's friend so um we're going to go there for a bit so what i'm going to do is i'm going to learn a bit of french um to spruce up for myself to want to go to paris and i'm also going to pick up my spanish again because another one of her friends is coming over who i really like and um her english isn't the best but i, I quite i like her a lot i mean she's quite a funny girl and i don't really want to have her make her feel uncomfortable so I want to I wanna make her feel as comfortable as possible. So I want to have my Spanish just a little bit brushed up, do you know I mean? just so I can exchange some pleasantries here or there. So that'll be really um, encouraging to do. And that's going to happen right now. Right? I've already um, started a couple of lessons on my Duolingo. I've got my books ready that I'm doing now. And I'm going to get started with doing that. So French and Spanish, um, up the podcasting, um, up in the writing, um, recording, DJ mixing, whatever it takes for me to kind of finally figure out and realize that, you know what, you might not be where you want to be just yet, but you're going to get there eventually. Just take your time, take your time, take your time. And that's why essentially I am. And obviously attach no expectations to stuff, man. That's, that's, that's when it, that's when the game gets a bit boring. That's when nothing is fun anymore. When you're attaching expectation, you're hoping for things to happen. Um, I'm doing this for fun. I'm doing it because I've, I get pleasure out of actually sitting here and talking to people on the interwebs, whoever they may be. If it's one person, two person, five, four, ten, eleven, whatever. Um, this kind of brings me a lot of joy and also allows my mind to not be so clogged up with, you know, um, whatever mental issue that I may, I may have lingering um, inside of me somewhere, laying dormant. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what I'm going to do in the next few weeks. And again, you know, we all, I think it happens a lot with um, people my age, right? I'm 31. So 
I think when you're between the ages of like 20, let's say 26, 20, let's say, let's say 26 and 35 or 36, right? 26 because you just left university or you just maybe finished working, I don't know, um, uh, serve a couple of menial jobs in the service industry, whether they be bar work, pub work, and you maybe moved, moved up. And you've kind of got moved up, quote unquote, um, because I don't actually believe in the whole moving up. I think there's that's another lie they've kind of sold us over the years. You know that you've the promised land is working in the office. That isn't true at all. Um, if what you're doing working in a bar is um, allowing you to live the lifestyle that you want to live, and you have no aspirations to get further up the career ladder, then just do what you're doing. You don't need to become a manager. Um, if anything, being coming a manager, that level of responsibility requires another level of effort, another level of mental acumen, another level of commitment of time, which people are not always um, uh, conscious of when they take that paycheck, take that raise, take the money. Because you know you have to expect, you have to expect it. Like if your place of work is giving you more money, they're obviously going to ask you. They're obviously going to ask more of you, right? They're not going to they're not going to let you get away with what you got away with before being a weekend staff if you're then getting paid suddenly what somebody would be getting paid if they're the general manager. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But I've seen some people are not conscious of that and they kind of expect the same level of um, work-life balance when they uh, then take on more money. So I think don't get sold down. Don't get sold that dream of like, oh, the promise hands in office is not. Um, getting into office is the same sort of shit. It's the same bullshit. It's the same people, um, you know, with inflated sense of egos, inflated sense of self. It's the same people telling you something like again if you're someone like me who kind of essentially wants to do your own thing you don't want someone telling you what to do right and wherever you work it doesn't matter if you're a, a, a street cleaner a dustman man postman uh, you work in a kebab shop you work in a bar you work in a hotel someone's always telling you what to do pick this up go there do that 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 someone's always telling you what to do and that's the frustrating part of anyone that has any kind of um delusional idea that they can somehow do it on their own right because it is quite delusional right it's quite crazy to think oh no I, I don't need to i don't need to work in a in a structured environment i can do it on my own right it's quite crazy to say that right but it's not right because there's plenty of examples out there there's plenty of people out there um case in point these two individuals i'm listening to on this podcast to who are just you know apart from where they grew up and their race and their families and their interests wherever they may be we're two we're exactly the same people right we're but we're all human beings Irish fear tim ferris exactly like me right they might be a little bit further down the road in their careers but they have essentially been able to carve out a little path for themselves that allows them to kind of be their own boss, right? To do things on their own dime. So much so that Ari Sophia essentially got kicked off of his own show of um, this is not happening and kind of, you know, brushed it off his shoulders and carried on going. But imagine if Ari Sophia was a industry writer, an industry figure and somebody that, you know, put a lot of credence towards him being the producer, executive director of a particular show. Imagine how soul crushing that would be to get kicked off your own show and that not be your thing anymore and they not give you any credit and not pay you anything. But essentially, because you've got your own thing going on, if this one thing that you did for Comedy Central uh, falls by the wayside, they don't pick it up or it gets cancelled or the executive scum you out of the deal, you can just carry on doing what you're doing, right? Carry on um, touring the country, doing these comedy shows, writing a bit, whatever it may be. You, you always got something going on. You're never, you're never beholden to one person. And at the moment, you know, I think we all are. Whether you work in a bar, you work in an office, if suddenly the company goes bust, we're all fucked, right? And that's not where you want to be. You want to be in a place where if one client drops you, you've got four others, you've got one other, you've got three other um, things going on in the background that you can kind of, you know, kind of continue on spinning the wheels for. They're not going to be as lucrative maybe as sitting down at a desk and getting paid a certain amount every day of the month, a particular day of the month, sorry. that Don't get me wrong, but by and large, that's where you want to be. And I think I've always had that kind of feeling in me, but even more so that feeling was kind of drummed back home um, recently when I was sitting down with some colleagues at work um, and they randomly started talking about, I wasn't in a conversation, but I just overheard them talking about somebody at work who um, earns a very high wage. I think it was something along the lines of £300,000 a year, which works out to about 14 to 15 grand a month. And they were talking about, oh, wow, man, that's crazy, isn't it? Like, we're on 30 grand and this person's got one more zero on the end of it. Like, what the fuck are they doing with their money? Like, that's crazy. Like, what did they, what, what did they spend their money on? I remember sitting there thinking, like, that's gross, isn't it? Like, number one, gross, talking about some, what someone earns, I think it's super gross. Number two, um, fantasizing about what that person has, what they could make. And number three, I just don't care. I do not care. Just don't care. I have no interest. Like, it doesn't pull me. It doesn't make me think, oh, man, I really should hustle. I really should really make sure I hand in this project really early and show my boss that I'm staying in late and do all these things so I can get a raise and I can be that guy, 300 grand guy. It doesn't make me think that. If anything, the first thing I think of is that, fuck, 
Has he ever gone home at 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. any day of the week? Probably not, right? Um, he has to attend every kind of meeting that exists under a sun, especially a leadership meeting. Um, when you're at that kind of level, you have to do those annoying things where even I did it at my small level, at previous, previous place I've been to, at a very minuscule level, where I went to, um, I don't know, Fashion Week, um, to, to uh, Paris Fashion Week, uh, Paris Men's Fashion Week, and I was there for like a day and a half, right? Because I had a meeting and then you have to come straight back, tiring. Then you have to go to Berlin, a day and a half, tiring. Imagine that level. Imagine him going to uh, a client meeting in Singapore, right, for two days, and you live in the UK. And the flight's 10 hours. It's like insane you know, the, what they have to do. And again, this guy could turn around to me and say, you know, it doesn't matter. I love my job. It's something I've always dreamed of doing. I've worked my way up here to do whatever. Da, 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 da. You, you could say that. And that's cool. I think if you're a person that loves your job and you find your vocation, more power to you. But to the person that's sitting there, like my colleagues were just obsessed with the money and the salary. And they're like, oh my God, wow, he's earning 300000 a year doing that. It's like you could earn 300000 a year just talking about Everton Football Club if you're a fanatic, right? We've seen so many examples of it, right? Like sitting, like those guys on AFTV, they're not any smarter than me or you, but they've decided to dig deep into their passion, double down, um, work extremely hard, right? That thing isn't, isn't, isn't easy. Traveling to all those fucking games, games you probably don't even want to go to just to get content, interviewing loads of people and then trying to extract the good ones out of the interviews you've done, editing that up, uploading it. Um, just It's just tiring. I know that grind. I've done a little bit of it with my YouTube myself, but imagine doing it on the AFTV level. And I'm sure they earn a good amount of money and they just sit there talking about something they actually give a shit about, right? They all love Arsenal and, you know, the full-time devil guys, the same sort of thing. So to be obsessed over someone's salary and then they are, and then the, the benefit the full-time devils and, or any YouTube person has or any person doing their creative work is that you're not shackled to a desk. You don't have to be at a desk at night. Fair enough, the company I work for is a bit different because we have a freedom and ownership thing. So that makes things a bit easier. You can come in when you want, which is why I'm recording this podcast a bit earlier today. I'm going to go in later, but you can kind of make your own hours. That makes it a bit easier. But, you know, working on a desk and then again, earn, earning 300000 a year, it just kind of defeats the purpose for me, in my opinion. Like, what's the point of earning that money if you can't leave when you want? <laughs> you essentially can't. You have to kind of, you know, keep up appearances and come at a certain time, leave at a certain time. It's just like, no, nah, not for me. So I think when I feel, I think if, if, if you ever hear someone speaking like that and you feel the way I do and you're like, oh. I don't really care what they make. I'm not trying to sit here and make that money. I want to go outside of this and do my own thing and make that kind of wage. Then you're definitely somebody that wants to do their own thing. And I would encourage you to just use your workplace as a framework, as a kind of foundation for your other things. Like don't see it as like um, you're going to work in the gravel pits and it's a fucking hell hole. See it as it's giving you the opportunity to number one, pay for your telephone bill, afford, afford you the ways to buy a camera, to, I don't know, take pictures of yourself, to buy outfits, um, to upload stuff onto the internet. Like see it as an opportunity, see it as a way, a place you're going to in order to kind of allow you to buy the tools and to use the services in order for you to kind of reach your dreams. And then what that will do is that it will make those Monday to Fridays more manageable. It will make waking up in the morning a little bit more manageable because you've got something to look forward to. Oh, yeah, I can't wait until I get back later after work. I'm going to do this, this, that, 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 that. Because those are obviously the most crucial times, right? The seven to ones. I sometimes, I can do my things in the morning and kind of spend in the evening, but that seven to one is usually a crucial time. So I recommend, I re highly recommend you guys do that so you don't get a little bit down on work. Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to talking about stuff I'm doing outside. I'm back DJing at Tapped uh, tonight. At Tap East in Westford, Stratford. If you guys are in the area, I don't think there are much people that listen to this podcast that live in Stratford or whatever it may be. But if you are in that area and you want somewhere to go, please come to Tapped at Tap East. It's a night I put on with my friend and my um, DJ colleague, um, Afro Musa. Here it is on Resident Advisor. I'm going to get up here on the screen for you guys to see. There we go. So that's Tapped at Tap East. Tap at Tap East, 12th, Friday the 12th of April, which is today, um, 7 International Square, London E21 EE. It's from 5 to 11. I think it might go an hour later, you know, if I'm feeling a little bit funky, we can do that. Loads of great craft beer. Um, it's me and Afro Musa playing, myself, Handsome Black Man, loads of disco, funk, hip-hop, pop, rock, R&B and reggae, and loads more. 
um, here's a flyer that I designed myself there. I'm very proud. Shot, shot, shot. But yeah, come to tap um, at Tappy's um, Westfield. I'm going to be there from 7 until close. So if you're around and you want to have a drink, have, have a little dance, so let's do this. I'm really looking forward to it. I've got all my DJ stuff packed up. I've got my playlist already sorted out. And I'm ready to DJ. Especially after watching the Exhibitionist, you know, the that um, Jeff Mills um, DVD again. After reading the piece on Resident Advisor, it just really got me inspired. And I, I read, listened, I watched, I read another interview with Crystal clear recently a dj that i played with back in the day man so long ago i, I dj with crystal clear when i was doing some little store launching in shoreditch and i played along i played like before him and he came after it was amazing um and he still remembers me now sometimes here and there so that's pretty cool to see but yeah i recommend you go you come to tappies at uh, tappies westfield highly recommend it it's going to be a great night more links or more details can be found in the show notes visit my website accidentalzinger.com click dj gigs and all my stuff will be on there Anyway, let's move on to some topics because with this, there's that's what we're here for, right? Number one, um, so number one, talking about DJ stuff and talking about things that I'm really intrigued about. And not gonna say, I mean, I'm intrigued. I'm very intrigued because I like to see um, the inception of something is always more fun, right? Like the kind of journey than you know the finished product, right? That's I think if you're like a Tiesto fan, it's probably fun to see if to see him play in some dingy place for 150 people and not really getting no love and then see what he's turned into now right even if you're not into the music i guess it's just fun to, i like seeing that journey like oh wow it's cool to see him go from that guy to this guy right it's really interesting to see that so um talking about people that went from zero to 100 really quickly there's this really good interview um with the one peggy goo the one that's the, the lady that's been on everyone's lips the lady that i'm sure there's quite a few guys who would like to have on their lips um, which is why they probably hate on her so much. But um, Peggy Google gave a really, really good interview with um, Evening Standard. And the reason why it's a good interview, because I think for the most part, she does go out of her way to not really, she doesn't talk as much as she probably, you probably think she does. I'm thinking about it. She doesn't really talk that much, right? About herself in public, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, she kind of keeps herself to herself, I guess, for the most part, because of the backlash she gets on social and because most of the time, you know, it's better to just, you know, um, show and prove with your work. And I guess the fact that she gets booked at so many reputable, reputable places, I guess it kind of um, uh, kind of um, it, it's a good it's a good kind of counter argument to anyone that says, oh, she's only there because she's a girl or because she's hot, blah, 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 blah. because, you know, all the good places that everyone wants to play at, they they want to book her, too. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't really make any sense that um, they all think she's shit and you think she's shit. It doesn't really make any sense. Let me just get this off here. Ah, oh, I lost the page now, didn't I? Silly Billy. Where is it? Uh, let me get it back up here again. I think I lost the page somehow. The interwebs can be annoying, can't they? Where is it? Oh, there it is. It went down here. Anyway, so Peggy Goo keeps herself to herself. She's not somebody that is no is always talking. Um, blah 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 blah. Let me get this up here again. Where is it? There we go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Let's show it here. This is always a bit hard to use. Anyway, so Peggy Goo, right? The, the girls on everyone's lips and the girl that I'm sure a lot of dudes would like to have on their lips, which is why they probably hate on her, but she'll probably tell you to get the fuck out of here. So she gave a really good interview with the Evening Standard. Um, uh, I think it was in the ES magazine, which should be all around London right now. So she's going to be even more famous than she's already. So for all you haters out there, it's probably going to be super annoying to see her plastered all over the uh, train lines and shit. But she gave a really good interview, and I think the interview is really good because, in general, I have informed about it, have read, a, read over it, and kind of meditated over something she said. She doesn't really talk as much as you think she talks, right? Like, considering how she, how forward she is on social media, she's always posting stuff. She's very, very interactive with her fans, all that malarkey. Um, she keeps herself to herself in terms of interviews. She doesn't really respond to some of the criticism that might exist out there in the interwebs most of the time because you know there's nothing really you can say when people just don't like you. Um, I don't think there's any way to explain it. I don't think there's any way to really convince them to. To like you or to give you a chance i think the only thing you can do is just to kind of show and prove with your actual work and i think the fact that she gets booked at so many reputable um top tier um elite of the elite um djs d your favorite djs d your favorite djs favorite venue place i think it kind of shuts up all the arguments but there's some points in it that i kind of want to speak about that i think are very very interesting uh so i made some notes about it but let's just read through the article and we can kind of speak about it in jest so this is a, a article on evening standard it's called dj peggy goo on the best way to deal with sexism kill them with kindness um peggy goo played almost 200 shows last year and has been described as the mo most beloved dj on earth which isn't probably true i don't think she's beloved 
I think she's beloved. No, she's beloved with fans. I think and she, if you look at her comments, you look at some of the comments online, people really love Peggy Goo. But I think within DJ circles, within the industry, I don't think there's a lot of goodwill with her in general. I think maybe it's not really to do with her. I think it's to do with the current climate in DJ land, right? Because, you know, like I mentioned before, I think there was a massive push with some female DJs out there that there wasn't enough um, female representation in most of the lineups, right? This is why some festivals, I forgot which one it was, I think it might have been Phil there, one of those festivals decided to have a 50-50 lineup, right? Which didn't really make any sense because you don't really want to, um, you don't really want to install those kind of rules on lineups because by and large, you know, there's no way to account for, uh, how do you say this? It's, it's pretty obvious that there's not going to be as many good female DJs as going to be male DJs, right? I don't know why that is. It, there's, I can't really explain the reason why, but there is there is there are more male DJs out there, so there'll probably be more better ones to choose from in that pool. So to say 50-50 is hard because you're essentially choosing from a smaller pool of people and with a women's DJ, so you're essentially putting people on the stage that probably have no right being there in terms of skill-wise. Now, again, a, a really good DJ, a re, um, I guess a, a female DJ could kind of shoot back at me and say, but you know, that's essentially what they do with the guys, right? You're, you're telling me all the guys that play on these festival stages are good DJs? No, of course not. And good or bad is subjective. But I think what should be happening is what most pros are doing. It's just a bit of common sense um, uh, lineup planning, right? It's like when, what was that? It's like when someone's doing a Latin American um, infused DJ night, right? Maybe it might be a good idea to book some DJs who are Latino American, right? Who are, who are Latino, who are from South America. But some of these dickhead promoters don't do that. And they'll pick up a bevy of entirely white DJs who all happen to be dudes then social media gets an uproar and then the promoters are all surprised. Like, why are you surprised? Like, just use, use some common sense. So a bit of common sense DJing, common sense booking will be a good one, right? Like, for instance, like, this is a really cheesy example, but I've always wondered, right, why there aren't a more uh, promoters out there putting on very heavy... Um, leaning female friendly Valentine's Day shindigs, right? Whether or not they're queer leaning or mostly uh, straight, why aren't there more parties out there that are heavily promoted to women that are Valentine's Day parties? Because I'm sure there's loads of girls out there that would love to go to a night, right? Out, especially in Shoreditch, where they play loads of great old school hip hop and R&B, especially the 90s R&B, like, you know, like super amazing 112 stuff that they could just sing to high, you know, sing, uh, you know, in high voices and screech and stand on tables and drink rosé and Prosecco and shit and just don't give a shit about dudes. Dudes can come if they want, but it's not a place to hook up. It's just a place for girls to go and dress sexy and just, you know, listen to R&B. Why aren't there more of these things? Don't know why it happens. Most of the times, it, uh, Valentine's Day happens and it's just, you know, your standard dude playing in a new era hat. So f for me personally, I never liked it. I never liked the idea that, you know, most of the time I go to the nightclubs and I go out and have a good time. I look around the dance floor and the dance floor is essentially mixed. But then when you look up at the DJ booth, it's always the same sort of person playing behind the decks, right? Um, in the dance floor, there's loads of different colors and creeds, loads of um, genders. I mean, I'm sorry, um, there's loads of girls there as well. And all of a sudden you look at the DJ booth and it's the same kind of dude playing it all the time. So I never got that in that respect. But I think Peggy probably represents the antithesis of that, right? She's essentially been thrust into this position, prim no, not primarily because she's a very good DJ, primarily because she makes really good tracks, and also because she's hot, and also because she happens to be a girl, and also because of her background and all that. So, like they've all played a role into where she's kind of got. And I think she, and I think for some people, she represents the kind of you know what they hate about the industry, about how what it's become, right? The idea fifty fifty women, the idea that you know you get someone in that you know, happens to be, I don't know, uh, gender, gender neutral, blah, 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 this background, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, I, I get why people can have those feelings, but I think after reading this interview, you can only have respect for it, so let's go on with the interview, so the interview starts, um, you can tell a lot about a person by the attitude to lifts, um, let me do this again, what's the, what's the lifts, um, so, um, impatient Peggy Goo, so impatient is Peggy Goo that she blows my intoler blows my own intolerance out of the water, people keep getting in, she must stabbing at the buttons and lift in the net, come on, um, once we are safely inside her plush suite, she's, uh, in town from Berlin, it becomes immediately apparent that her impatience is born out of a rude, is not born out of rudeness, but out of a mile a minute has lust up for life and a desire to get on with things. Frankly, it's a miracle she managed to sit relatively still long enough to be interviewed. South Korean Goo, 28, ooh, Jesus, she's done a lot, isn't it? Only 28, well done, girl. There's typical multi-hyphenate, a DJ, musician, producer, fashion designer, illustrator who played nearly 200 shows last year alone. DJ into crowds to devoted fans from Australia to Asia, not forgetting Belfast, one of the best cities to DJ, 
and of course Berlin, which usually is her home, or at least as home as anywhere can be when you spend most of your life on a plane. Sometimes I wake up in my hotel like, where am I? <laughs> and then you would, would you like a juice? I'm going to order a juice. She calls for room service. Any juice, she says, maybe something zingy. As she needs it, as if she needs it. She's in a good mood tonight, having just played her new EP, Moment to Floating Points, one of her favorite producers. The two-track EP sees her singing in the Korean again uh, more ambitiously than she did once uh, on once her previous EP that released last year. So, you know, you get a good idea of who she is. Um, she's very impatient. She likes to drink green juices. What is the DJs drinking green juices? I'm surprised not... Uh, I know we've got Richie Horton um, does his um, sake. I'm surprised no one's done... Um, a DJ line of green juices that they kind of, that'd be awesome, right? Yeah. Imagine they could do a, a line of green juices that they could somehow get to you. Hmm. Yeah. Imagine there was a line of green juices that you could have stocked in certain hotels around the world that most DJs stay in when they come into town. It'll probably be hard to get a list of those hotels, but it'd be quite cool to do that, right? Get a, a list of hotels that most DJs play in, uh, stay in, sorry, when they're in town, and then produce a particular kind of um, green juice or smoothie or general that, you know, one that, you know, a perfect hangover cure, something to give you energy, something to keep you calm, whatever it may be called. Those kind of juices have to have them in stock. That'd be a fucking awesome idea, and I might have to, I might have to fucking write that down in my notes, actually. Um, Again, I write so many stuff in my notes that I probably won't end up doing, but let's just write it down anyway. Green uh, juice for DJs stocked. Uh, let's see here. For DJs stocked in hotels around the world uh, where they play. Yeah. Boom. Okay. There we go. We got, see, that's the benefit of reading interviews with people that are really successful. It makes you get you inspired. If you read interviews like this and, and you just start hating, there's something wrong in your brain. Your brain's wired a bit weird. Anyway, uh, Goo calls her sound K House. Although it's hard for me to rationalize my music sometimes, um, that her sound is hard to, to categorize as part of the appeal. Her influence um, include Acid House, Old School, Chicago House, Detroit Techno, with the odd African beat thrown in. Her DJ sets are just as eclectic. It has to. It has to have a journey. If you're playing at a really long set. My longest has been six hours. It's difficult because you can't just play big tunes. Three hours is a good enough length for me. She wasn't drawn to K-pop growing up though. A lot of people ask me that, but no. Just because I'm singing in Korean doesn't mean... I don't want to sound rude, but I don't listen to much of it because the lyrics aren't so catchy. Cool. Uh, is that cultural appropriation? I don't know. It can't be because she's from Korea, right? Um, but I know some fucking work motherfuckers on Twitter will get all up in arms about it. Um, Goo likes to speak in short, uh, staccato sentences. This, this whoever's interviewing her fucking is in love with Goo, isn't it? And while her English is perfect, the accent is freakishly French for a South Korean who has never lived in France. You think I sound French? Ooh, people always say that. Um, she laughs. Today is she's dressed in red sweatpants, a hoodie by Bianca Shandong. On. big up big up big up ask her to describe her own style however and she demures i don't describe it because i don't want to define it oh she's so hipstery cringe but i love it because i could never do this sort of stuff i can never talk about myself in this sort of way with a straight face but you know nowadays you kind of have to have a bit of you kind of have to do a bit of this right you kind of have to be a bit um a bit cringy a little bit corny a little bit self-absorbed but a little bit aloof right you kind of have to be like that right so i think for anyone reading these interviews and oh man real djs don't do that don't give interviews and blah, 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 blah. like relax right this is the world you live in you want to be you want to be big shot you want to you know secure the future of your family like she's going to interview the fucking evening standard for instance she's a fucking dj she's going to interview an evening standard like doesn't i mean this is where you want to be this is the level you want to operate if you want to kind of you know pierce through the the zeitgeist pierce through the mainstream if you don't want to do that fair enough but you still have to employ a little bit of this sort of like cringiness in your um rhetoric when you're speaking it's part of the deal right so there she is dressed all nice and shit and then what, what's that clothes she's wearing she's wearing a burberry t-shirt by ricardo t-shirt i'm assuming and of course of course they don't let her wear these one these one look things i think those those earrings are that brand right i've got the brand what is it called perfect something statement they sort of, sort of like cufflinks that go in in the lobe of your ear um anyway um that's what she's wearing and they don't let you wear anything else so that's what she's got on that course it reminds me a little bit of what that martin margella t-shirt that they did back in the day right but anyway um she first going to djing 10 years ago right so this is a 10-year journey which kind of specs out a lot to what 
let's say, did she pop a bit? She popped maybe for me in general. I can she came in my radar 2017, I think. So I think this kind of goes into it does really relate to the whole um uh comedy circuit too, right? In I think in the comedy world, they always say it takes ten years before you get good. And I think in a DJing world, it maybe takes ten years before you start earning like, you know, the big, big hundred thousand bucks um a session sort of way. I think so. I think it takes about ten years. Cause um let's look actually let's quickly scan back, right? Because there's this article I read here. This is from um Mix Mag and it's called What DJs Really Earn. I read a while back and I'm always kind of using as a sort of like a gauge to kind of see where I'm kind of at, yeah, just as a kind of a goal to kind of aim at, right? Because in general, I would also, even though it's a hobby for me, I would also like to eventually get to a point where I'm essentially playing all these places that I love, know and love, and it's a hobby on the side and I do other things, but it's also allowed me to kind of, you know, um, live and be able to pay my rent. So with this got like a little tier of how much DJs get paid, like in general, right? In terms of where you currently are. And I would say I'm definitely on this first tier, right? And the first tier is this one. No, where is it? No, where is it? Read the article from the beginning. There you go. There's a the first tier is this one. Fledgling local resident, right? Tier number one. And it says the following. It says, um, you've made it out of the bedroom and into the club, promoting and playing a regular night at the back of a wine bar or in your hometown. You're pl- you're pulling in the punters, but not getting much more attention in that. The gigs, often playing for free to get exposure. I'm doing that in a couple of weeks for a warehouse party, but most of the time I'm playing for money. Uh, Maybe making 100 quid a night, exactly what I get paid. Sometimes 150, sometimes 200. No, sometimes 150 is the highest. Um, And playing once or twice a a weekend if you're lucky. Um, And it says here, 100 uh, 100 pound times 50 sets a year is five grand, which I didn't really think about that shit. How many sets I do I play a year? Fucking hell um probably still buying your own drinks no we get drinks tokens or we get given drinks although transportation costs are negligible yep i usually get a pay for my own uber and whatever um management doesn't really exist so net after tax before tax sorry i mean include all the expenses is about two two thousand five hundred pound a year right that you're getting paid so that's essentially the kind of level i would say i'm at um in comparison but i don't even know why i brought this up but yeah um so i'm about what i'm about five years in six years in DJing on my own, right? Five years in, let's say, estimate. Well, let's say four. I don't know if I'd go by my RA list. But anyway, that's kind of what she's saying. 10 years is sort of like the average time it takes to kind of make it. Anyway, it continues. DJ became a serious pursuit in 2012 while she was living in London and studying fashion design in London College of Fashion. Now, this is where I, this is where the kind of, I'd assume the hate would start from, right? So she started to seriously pursue in 2012 while she was studying at the London College of Fashion, right? The LFC. I was supposed to go to college, but didn't. Because I just wasn't interested anymore, she says. Matter of factly, in lieu of attending classes, she practiced DJing, spent time at record stores and in studios, taking time to learn everything she could about music, i.e. skiving from school and DJing a lot and going out. I failed the course. My parents didn't let me come back to South Korea, right? So essentially her parents sent her to the UK, to London specifically, on their dime for her to kind of graduate from college and she didn't do that because they paid for it. So I had to spend 11 months just um asian parents you know just doing her thing 11 months just you know hustling working whatever she was maybe doing eventually she went back to the to to the course i passed it in the end she failed and then got back on it and passed it and didn't have a reason to stay in london anymore so i went to berlin again there's no mention of work no mention of anything so essentially her parents paid for her to come to the uk fail the course you got back on it succeeded went to berlin and they paid for that too her goal and again and i don't i don't imagine she was doing much in berlin either right um which isn't a bad thing but i wouldn't be doing much either her goal was to be the first south korean dj um to Ber- to dj at the notorious elitist Bergheim club which she did in 2016 right so she did that what three four five six four years after dj four years after taking djing seriously he's <laughs> like jesus christ in the beginning i didn't have money i was a student so they had to pay for it so you know she was just she was getting whatever allowance she was meant to be getting nothing else they were like now you want to do fashion now you want to do music what do you want to do next right which you know must be annoying for parents that have money and their kids a bit wayward i was like if i fail i'll come back just invest in me one more year i got this and essentially she did do it in fact they supported her for almost two years in the beginning they were like what this d what's this dj what have why do you have to go out at 2am and then come back at 5 with cigarette smell but we're best friends now only the most narrow minded mum could fail to be impressed at her daughter becoming South Korea's most prominent female DJ Uh, so I kind of get where the hate comes from in in this way looking at looking at it from that level I think there isn't you can't really um, you you can get it why people don't like her right 
Um, and I kind of uh, rip because again, I didn't know this previously. So essentially, what we found out for his interview is that her family is her parents are very affluent, right? They're extremely rich. They're wealthy enough to be able to afford to send their, you know, um, young daughter to London, which is not one of the most cheapest cities in the, in, in Europe. Um, it's the complete opposite of that. Uh, to study a course in LFC that also happens to have one of the highest um, tuition rates um, in the entire UK, right? They they operate right at the top threshold. I think it might be eight grand or maybe more. I'm not sure how much it is for international students. She, yeah, it should be international, wouldn't she? So it might be even 10 grand. So it's no, it's a big, it's a it's a big amount of money you pay, and I'm pretty sure you don't pay in installments. I'm pretty sure you have to pay uh, flat out straight away. So her parents are very rich. They afforded the opportunity to come to the UK to study a course in one of the most prominent universities in London, and essentially allowed her, to, gave her the kind of license to kind of fuck around and stumble around and figure stuff out. And in between that time, she got given another extension then to go to Berlin and go and figure out life there where you know for the most part Berlin is like full on debauchery the first time you moved there especially the first couple of years and then it kind of levels out into being you know your kind of home so she kind of like you know was she her parents basically allowed her to do what she wanted to do so I kind of get where the hate comes from in that regard and I think I wrote something down there right the the um and I guess for most people that begin DJing I think it, comedy being the same thing you kind of do it just through I don't think it's you don't even do it in the idea of like wanting to become rich and famous right and you always do it in kind of um you always do it as a supple it's always kind of a, a thing you do on the side right is there something that you're purposely pursuing to kind of oh one day i'm gonna break through and become swim far there are some people out there that do that for some regard but most of the time it's because of a love of music right a love of club culture you go to a nightclub for the first time and you're smoky and there's smoke everywhere and people dancing and people's tops are off and people hooking up in corners and the lights are going and this music you never heard before and there's this dude or girl in the corner spinning the tracks you're like fuck i want to be that person right there's other things that happen sometimes you go into a club and you're like shit i want to be the bouncer i want to be the dog guy dog girl i want to work behind the bar things trigger you right so you essentially come out of it through you come you come you come to djing because of the love of music so to somehow get somebody in the djing circle who's kind of young in 28 very young really in her dj career who has essentially uh been able to make it and progress up the ranks just you know in a very professional manner because it sounds like she was very headstrong and clear about what she wanted to do she wanted to make it as a dj right she wasn't interested about doing this fashion course wasn't interested about doing anything else she wanted to make it as a dj so she was able to do it because she had all the she had all the free time in the world right her parents were able to kind of you know sustain her lifestyle and i think for other people out there who hate her i guess it must be a hard pill to swallow because we're all doing this stuff like me for instance i'm recording a podcast now i'm gonna upload it i'm gonna go to work I'm going to come back and then I'm going to go DJ, right? I don't have the time between now and my DJ set to just sit at home and, you know, prepare my playlist. I have to do this stuff. I have to do this stuff, you know, bit by bit. Two hours here on Monday, three hours on Tuesday, two hours on Wednesday. I have to do it in between kind of my regular day-to-day -day life. So I guess for some people out there who hate her, it must be like, fuck, I had to do so many things. I had to sacrifice so many things. I had to work around the clock in order to kind of pursue my dreams. And here you are, little rich Asian girl, being given the opportunity to kind of just do what you want to do because your parents are super rich. And now I have to kind of sit here and um, swallow the fact that you're on every single publication, um, every single move you do, if you fart, every company is kind of covering you. I get it. I understand, right? I get that hate. But on the other side, I would say, I also kind of appreciate Peggy Goo because I think a lot, it's hard to have sympathy for rich kids. It's hard. I get it for some people, but you have to really put yourself in their shoes and think to yourself like, it's very hard. It's, it's very hard if you're a rich kid to be motivated to do anything. Like, let's be for real, right? Because some of us, we know how some of us are when we get a tax rebate, right? When we get a tax refund or when you get incorrectly paid a certain way or when you get a raise or whatever. You know, we know how reckless we can be, right? When we get paid money and we're like extra money and we're like, oh my God, I've got a surplus of cash. And you just start spending loads of shit. You don't really care and you're just taking life as it goes, right? Now imagine living in a world Living, living a life where, you know, from the moment you were young for the moment that you become older, you haven't lent, wanted for nothing. Your house has never been short on anything, right? Your electricity has never gone out. There's always been a fully stocked fridge. Um, you've gone on family holidays. I've never went on one because, you know, I grew up fucking dirt poor. Um, what if you wanted a phone, it got, you know, you smashed your phone, you, you bought a new one the next day. That kind of lifestyle doesn't necessarily um, equip you for being a hustler. It doesn't necessarily equip you for being an entrepreneur. Essentially, Peggy Goo has kind of defied all those stereotypes of rich kid because she's essentially gone into a world 
of DJing where yes, in the in the beginning she probably could have got quite far based on her looks, based on her money, based on her connections, based on her background. I'm pretty sure. But there's a, there's a limit to that, right? You have to be also good at what you do, right? It's essentially like the comedy thing, right? If you're a YouTube influencer or a YouTube person and you've got a big following on YouTube and you decide to suddenly start doing stand up, there are there, there, there's a limit to how far you could get, right? You can draw people into the club. You can probably sell out arenas. But once you hit the stage, after those five, that first five minutes, I think someone mentioned it, right? I think someone mentioned it. To, I forgot what podcast, but someone mentioned that famous people that do comedy have five minutes of good grace. After that, you better come with the jokes, right? So the public give you five minutes. Oh, wow, Dave Robert De Niro. Ha, 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 ha. Then you have to come with the jokes. And if you haven't got no jokes, you're going to get booed out of the arena. So the same thing happens with DJs, right? You get five minutes. You get maybe, I don't know, less than that. You get a, re you get a little threshold until the time you have to realize, okay, does she make good tracks? Is she a good DJ? And from everything I've seen online, I don't think there's anyone out there that can really say with a straight face that she's not a good DJ and that she doesn't make good songs, right? You can't say that. That I think, uh, I, I think a track, whatever, I play it, I play it, I don't know, nearly every other week that I DJ. Like, there's no like, there's no time that I don't play it and it always brings a smile to my face. Dun, 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 dun. Like, it's fucking amazing track. Don't ever tell me it's not, right? So I get it. It's annoying. She's a rich girl. She'd be given all the fucking benefits, all the uh, privileges and advantages in the world and it's propelled the position that she's got to now. But when she got the opportunity to show and prove, she showed and proved. She's a really good DJ and a really good producer. And by and large, she doesn't really bother anyone. But again, I understand it's very hard to have sympathy for rich kids because essentially they're given all the toys in the toolbox, in a toy box, and they get given, you know, carte blanche, nothing. I, I understand, but let's be honest. Like most rich kids that we know of or that we've heard of, let's look at Donald Trump being a really good example of it. They turn out to be fucking dickheads, right? It's just a nature of the game. It's not something you can't even blame them for it in some regard. It's the kind of like, you know, it's the nature of where you're growing up and how you grew up, right? I'm pretty sure that Olivia Jade girl that got get mixed up in the Laurie McClellan thing of the, the woman from Full House, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, she probably isn't not the nicest girl in the world. Even if she is, I take it back. But, you know, do you blame her for that, right? Her, her, her mum is, you know, over here um, getting coaches to Photoshop her head on certain people or fob her results and shit. You're going to be a bit of a dickhead, right? Because, you are you know, you grew up in a bit of an entitled, privileged person that got given everything they wanted. I can get it. But I guess in Peggy Gustav's uh, criteria, she's kind of, you know, circumvented that and done away with those stereotypes. So let's give her a bit of a shot. Anyway, let's get back to the interview. But again, I understand why people hate her in that regard, reading this. Because again, I didn't know she was a rich kid. I didn't really get the hate. Um, I got, I didn't get the hate in that regard, but now reading it, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, why people do get a lot, don't like her in that regard, because it's not really her. People don't really like rich kids in general, right? They, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like that famous uh, Donald Trump line, I've got, I got given a small loan of one million. Everyone's like, oh, small loan, that's not small, but it, it is still small in his regard, you know what I mean? And if you can get one million dollars and flip it to a hundred mil, that's a, that's still, that's, that's very good. That's as good as the person that had one dollar in their pocket and started fucking Shell Motor Company, right? It's still the same sort of thing. Um, anyway, um, to be fair to Mrs. Mrs. and Mrs. Mr. 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 and Mrs. Gu, their daughter's career choice must have been a shock. Neither has any musical background, although Mrs. Gu is a very good singer and plays guitar and piano. My dad loves singing and guitars. Gu herself was trained as a classical pianist like every Asian kid and did dance, taekwondo, maths and swimming. She was pragmatic about the style of parenting. My mum was not a person who always gave me a compliment. If I got an A, she was like, why didn't you get an A plus? Yeah, that's standard Asian African parents. But inside she's happy. I appreciate people make jokes about Asian parents wanting you to be a doctor's impression but my mom never stopped me always supported me now she's like i plan for you to be a dj i knew it well you know that is start part of the part of the plan you know but i guess when she was faffing around in london and moving to fucking berlin and doing god knows what i'm pretty sure her parents weren't like oh i knew you'll be a success but you know that's the beauty of having um immigrant parents um Gu was headstrong from the get-go, so much so that she moved to London age 14, a black with her parents' blessing. Yeah, alone, she says, I did my GCC and levels in Croydon. It's because I wasn't doing well in Korea. Her parents told, paid for her to live with a guardian. Some of my, some of my dad knew, although she changed guardians three times, each one being unable to deal with her for more than a year. Um, what was she doing that made her so hard to handle? When you're looking at stuff to someone's kid, you have a lot of responsibility. So they were looking locking me in the house. One time I came home ten minutes late. They were freaking out. If I if they'd given me a lot of freedom, I'd have, I'd been a good kid. But they didn't let me do anything. Goo was Goo has been open about her mental health, revealing that she has suffered from depression, and anxiety, particularly while on the road. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, spending those long period. I think there was a Nina Kravitz documentary or one of the others. Spending that time alone on the road can be a bit fucked up with your head. 
Um, her candor endeared her to fans, many of whom are yeah, young Asian women who aren't exactly overwhelmed with strong female role models from their own cultures. What advice would she give to those suffering from mental health issues? First of all, you're not alone. I'm a person who needs to find a solution. So if you have a problem, you solve it. You don't ignore it. You need to listen to you. Talk to a friend. Talk to a doctor. Try medication, yoga. Everyone's different. Cool. Um, I guess, again, like I said, um, touring as much as she does, 200 sh uh, shows a year. With all the stuff on social media, with her peers kind of hating her, with maybe industry stuff that she's heard of in the road, I get it, right? And obviously, didn't she used to go out with Jack Master too? That was that period, right? I'm pretty sure she went out with Jack Master, so that might have, you know, added to the added to the confusion. So loads of mess. What helps is her traveling with other people and keeps positive influences around her. I'm also trying to meditate. When when, when I was touring, when I was touring 200 shows i didn't have a life this year i still have a lot of gigs planned but it's important to have one weekend off so i can focus on something else and i really agree agree with that on my level fucking basement um pub level i play mostly every week and i even sometimes get a bit exhausted right playing every friday and then playing every other saturday so sometimes i don't even have a weekend off like i've never I, I don't think i've had a weekend off in a while like an actual weekend off friday to sunday um it's always been some sort of djing thing and, and again i'm not touring the world i'm just playing around the corner from where i live so i can imagine what it must be traveling what it must be going to new places meeting new people shaking hands again and uh, it just it can be a lot it can be really really exhausting, especially if you're spending most of that time on your own um this is her wearing a, a, an amazing i think that's marnie right yeah, it is Marnie. Awesome outfit there. Love that. Um, it's hard to imagine her having time for anything else, yet she managed to launch a fashion collection at Paris Fashion Week last October. Uh, Karen, which means a uh, giraffe thing, um, Korean goose obsessed with giraffes, saying her spirit animal came into being after her friend Virgil Abloh. Again, connections. Artist director Louis Vuitton Menswear introduced her to the NGG, New Guards Group, right? Her former fashion direction, uh, her his former fashion production house. He doesn't really doesn't use it at all. New Guards Group. He immediately offered to produce Karen. Um the range of two piece shirts tops based heavily on her own look, one which her fans frequently adopt at her gigs. She also creates legions of giraffes in her honor. Um in the form of soft toys, big and small posters. Every time I go somewhere there's a giraffe. Last year I donated them to orphanages. I'm actually thinking of doing an exhibition of them because it's really an effort that fans go to and I don't take it lightly. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. So every gig people are giving her giraffes and shit. What's she wearing here? Christopher Kane t shirt, Nike shoes. Yeah, th yeah these shoot these shoots, it's always Christopher, it's always head to toe looks, isn't it? They never let you anywhere or anything else. So annoying. Um, much has been made of the fact that good says for female DJ in industry still dominated by men. Female DJs also typically earn only half of what they male counterparts do. But Goo is reluctant to talk about her own experiences of sexism, which is very wise because enough that you can say that's going to appease those people. The best revenge is me doing well, she says. She reasons, killing them with kindness. I don't need to talk about it because I've already proved those guys wrong. In any case, she thinks the future is bright female DJs. I don't even like being called them, I like calling the female DJs. There are less of us than men, that's for sure. But there are some killer women DJs out there. A lot of male DJs even say they want to play with the same ratio as men to women, which I agree with. I said it myself, right? I go to nightclubs a lot. I'm always out clubbing. I will definitely class myself as a club kid first, DJ second. And I get annoyed sometimes going to nights and it's just the same old fucking fuddy duddy faces playing the same old rooms, right? And you look around the dance floor and the dance floor is a lot more diverse, a lot more eclectic, a lot more... Uh, of a range of different people than the DJ booth and it's super super annoying right because you don't have to do that much and again like I said how many Afro uh, inspired events have I been to where there's been no black DJ and again I'm not that kind of person to be like you know um um I'm not that person to call out culture appropriation or to kind of you know put my fist up in the air uh whatever say black power but how many afro-caribbean that's i've been to is no black dj this is fucking insane that happens right and it happens again and again and again and again it just takes some common sense djing to kind of get that involved but also i think the thing with peggy good that's fucking interesting that's really bizarre in this case is that even though it says here that um some dominated by men female djs um also only gets paid half of what her male camp counterparts do she's not one of them she gets paid probably more than a lot of male DJs, Peggy Goo, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's female. A lot of it also has to do with the fact that she's a good DJ, a great DJ, a great producer, don't get me wrong. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that she is a bit of a token in the industry. She is the female um, Asian, Korea, uh, sorry, female um, DJ that happens to be from Korea that also grew up in London, Berlin. I mean, she's got the amalgamation of some of the best places to be as a musician or somebody with a musical taste. She's got all those kind of inside one uh, combination and she's also fucking awesome on social media. That helps. 
So she can't really talk about male privilege because essentially she's been given a female privilege. She's got some sort of privilege allowed her to come on that kind of level. Again, I'm a big believer and I'm a fan of her. I've seen her play a few times and she's what she's been able to do is that even though she's got this privilege, she's able to be able to back up with talent. A lot of people don't do that, right? A lot of people talk a big game, but aren't necessarily good DJs, right? Like that Mama Shake interview recently on, on Resident Advisor, which I think is probably the reason why they took off the comments. Mama Shake has a Resident Advisor mix series. She's, you know, it's a regular sort of interview they kind of run through you with and they talk to you about your setup, about where you recorded the mix, what you're going to do in the future. It's a really black and white basic interview for the most part and then somehow in the interview she somehow gets into social justice warrior stuff and starts talking about privilege all this sort of stuff you're like hold on you're studying a phd right you live in one of the most affluent countries in the world like what the fuck are you talking about essentially you got this essentially part of the reason why you're getting the gigs that you're getting is because you talk so much smack on social media about um social justice issues it's like come on let's just really rein it in a bit and let's just understand what we're all doing here and understand what opportunities is given us, right? I think Peggy understands that she's kind of been given the opportunity to be given, partly because of how she presents herself and how good she is on camera and you know how amazing she happens to be as a DJ too. It helps. But let's understand that privilege and let's use it to our advantage. And then hope that these fucking dickhead promoters can use some common sense and then start booking more DJs, more female DJs that are kind of, uh, that you know, that cover a, a lot more bases that aren't maybe as, you know, um, they're, what do you call it they don't fit in that box because at the t moment you know there's this, uh, there's this influx of model worthy female DJs who have kind of popped up out of nowhere who have kind of blown up everywhere and it kind of is a bit off-putting I think for me personally as a guy and I must so, and I must think it must be the same for women right I get it they need to kind of rejig the balances but then don't just go out and just start booking all the hot DJs let's just get more female DJs involved anyway that cover all the bases right and just kind of have a bit more common sense booking so in that way Peggy Goo won't get as much stick because there's oh loads of other girls getting booked but the fact that she's the only one that's really being booked at the highest level like her Amelia Lenz Nina, Nina Kravitz and maybe a couple of others um Hannah Hoof maybe they are then because they're the only ones they are then having they're, they're essentially um copying the same it's the same sort of thing happening in the male dj place right it's the same thing that they're talking about is kind of being replicated in the female dj space right the top five percent are earning 10 times what anyone else is earning and that's where the kind of hate comes from i think in my experience so i think the more female DJs they get involved the less hate that she would get overall potentially anyway i'm not sure if this is going to happen but potentially um there's a scant detail about good personal life online so i'm surprised when she starts talking about her boyfriend the photographer and director uh, jonas lindstrom which means official now that we know she's probably split up with jack master um would, did it come because of the back of that kind of incident jack master had we don't know i don't care not my business um we've been together since february she says with a enthusiasm of first flush of love he's very talented he did the hermes campaign and ysl and a big calvin klein campaign and a kendrick my music video they met on a shoot before i'd been meeting a lot of insecure guys they had to keep proving that they were a man you know <laughs> but with him he's relaxed he's confident he's good at what he does he loves his job he works hard so we motivate each other i need that he's amazing he had to have to, he had to be to keep up with peggy goo this writer fucking is in love with peggy goo, isn't it? Who, who wrote this um what's the person name give them a shout out because they were on peggy goo's nuts laura craig so yeah um check out this article it's a really good one i think everyone's gonna be talking about it in dj circles again i get how people hate her because essentially she's super successful and she's come from a very privileged wealthy background but i think you know the left again i think if she was white ooh, 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 if she was white and had blonde hair and blue eyes and she was from notting hill she would be getting pelters like pelters and she hanged around with um What's her face? Who's that girl? Um, fucking dull that everyone fucking talks about. Um, the one that's always on Vogue. Um, what's her fucking name? The it girl. I don't know. She hanged out with those fashion it girls from London, right? She would be getting pelters. But I think it's she's in such a weird place where she's kind of been getting a knocky life from the hate because, you know, she's Asian. Um, you know, uh, because she comes literally comes from Korea. She's not like an, you know, uh, she she well, didn't grow up from here. She moved to London in fourteen. Her parents are very well. I think it kind of inoculates her from a lot of the hate. But if she was blonde, would she was blonde with blue eyes? Oh, they would be hating on her so hard. And again, I just I, I just wish there was more conversation being had about just how difficult it must be to be very talented and very good looking, also very wealthy. There is something that people don't talk about too often. Because I think, you know, the general Rax Richard story is that, oh, I came to this place with just a bag on my back with only a dollar in my pocket. You know, that's the kind of Rax Richard story people like to hear. But people don't really like want to hear the story of like, yeah, my mum was, I don't know, an MP. My dad is a, a very successful lawyer. 
and here I am, the owner of this record label. People don't really like that. It's just like, oh, yeah, of course you're a owner of a record label. Your mom had all the money. You know what I mean? But it's still hard to start a business up. It's still hard to employ people to make a business successful, to sign the right artists. It's a difficult thing to do. It's not, it's not easy. Plus, like I said, you always have the safety net of your parents having all the money in the world, right? So you don't necessarily need to do anything. There's no motivation. Your parents give you a fucking allowance, right? You have a... What's that thing? Is it hedge fund? What's that thing called? Um, I don't know. That thing where the parents leave you money. Like, you have an inheritance, right? Like... There is something needs to be said by people don't really talked about too often. But again, I just think I, I think I really commend Peggy Goo because I think in general she got a foot in the door because of what she looks like, because of how she dressed, and because of where she's from. And you know, and she got given the advantage of being able to practice all those years because her parents allowed her to have a lifestyle. She didn't need to get like a regular job. She might be able to work in bars here or there, but for the most part, she could concentrate on her DJing and it's pay dividends, right? And there's an added added thing that people don't want to talk about here too. Maybe she's just really talented. Maybe that's one of the things you just have to you have to suck up. Maybe she's just more talented than you. All these things said, maybe she's just really talented. She's got a background in music. She's been learning piano since she's one. I don't know one. If you're an Asian family, that might help being a DJ. That might help being a good, good producer. That could help really. Her parents sing, right? Even though they said it's a weird sentence. Since I'm along the line, she's not got any musical background in her family, but her parents sing. Like I don't know, man. Maybe she's just de destined to be this way, right? And again, I'm interested to see how it, her story develops. But yeah, it's a very good interview. DJ Peggy Goo on the best way to deal with sexism, kill them with kindness. At that new standard, I'll link you below in the show notes. Anyway, that's an hour of my time there. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to this single show episode number one seven nine. Um, I've ranted and raved a bit much about Peggy Goo, but I'm really interested in her story and how it goes and how it evolves. So sorry about that. Not sorry. Yes, sorry. And again, um, this is the last episode for the week. I'll see you, seeing you guys again to next week for another episode of the show. If, until then, um, take care and all that malarkey. If you guys are in the area on Friday, um, come see me play tonight at Tap East in Westfield from a night called Tapped. You can find the link below in the show notes. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you listening via the podcast app, leave me a review. Um, for those of you guys listening or watching via YouTube, like and subscribe and let your friends know what I'm doing. Any questions, leave me a comment and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace and take care.